So I, I have to throw this. I, I don't we don't get political on this show in any way, shape, or form. But I saw a bumper sticker the other day that infuriated me to no end. And I just I I literally was seeing red and I was so upset and I felt uh very attacked. It said Toy Story 2 was okay. F you, you freaking monster. That's all it said? That's what it said. <laughs> and I was so mad. I'm like, screw you. It's one of my favorite movies. I think it's one of the greatest sequels ever. It is. It really yes. is. Toy Story 2 was okay. Yeah, I don't buy it. That's a heartless person, right? There. Are, are they looking for road rage? Well, you that's know, what is I'm somebody, thinking. you know, did you cut them things... off? As soon as you... <laughs> no, I'll give him a buzzer, a Woody. <laughs> screw you. Uh, so yeah that really set off my uh so my so, uh, so we're already breaking the first cardinal rule here of this universe that we're about to discuss we're uh actively talking and maybe oh we that shouldn't. is true yeah we did joke last episode that we were just going to um come on and, and say nothing for two hours right and and by the way if you're tuning in for the first time my name is jim and uh, my compatriot is Jeff here, and you are listening to TMI, Confessionals of the Nerd Kind. That's a mouthful, by the way. You see what we did there? Nerd. Close yeah. Encounters of the Third <laughs> Kind. So clever. We're still proud of ourselves. And now, let me just say this up front, because nobody ever does this, um, and maybe because nobody ever listens all the way through, but if you would like to reach out to us just to tell us how great we are or how much you hate us, you can email. You can always you're actively email. inviting hate mail. Yes. Is that what you're doing right I now? I am because we get nothing. Maybe I'll. I'll if somebody it. sends me a Toy Story three, sucked. <laughs> three or two? Well, yeah. If you if you only thought two was okay, then you you have to really come down hard mm. on three because waterworks get going i think these people are just not in touch with their emotions no they're not um yeah. but but let us know regardless the email is tmi podcast 2018 at gmail.com that was very prescient to keep the uh, year we started in there mm. yeah <laughs> thanks, dates us thanks. immediately thanks, thanks dave <laughs> <laughs> yeah tmi movies look for that popcorn bucket and there you have it oh, popcorn bucket i didn't even have popcorn um, cause you gotta be quiet. You gotta be quiet. Yeah. There was yeah. one guy that was two seats Ooh. down from me who brought in contraband and it was a loud plastic bag. Yeah. Well, I wish that there were aliens <laughs> ladies behind me. They <laughs> did not shut up the entire effing movie. Even if you whisper, you could have heard well, it in the that, theater. It's, it's worse because they were trying to whisper and we knew going in, I went with my buddy, Frank. And they were talking all through the trailers, talking through the ads, which is which is fine. But the ads are pretty loud and I can still hear you. And Frank actually yeah. turns to me and he goes, they won't start, they won't shut up. And I'm like, well, let's see when the movie starts. No. Nope. Yeah. All the if way you the if you feel the need to speak during the loud ads so that your voice is louder yes. than the ads, then just stay home and, and have a phone conversation. I was it was at the point where I thought maybe the other woman was blind and she was just explaining the movie to her. That would be a whole, <laughs> you know, that would that would be a whole other movie, like a dark place. That would be, I don't know. I don't know. So. So, yes, A Quiet Place, day one, which is actually the third in the franchise. It is the third in the franchise, although we know we do have some connective tissue other than just it being in the I, same universe. I forgot that um, I forgot all about the, the second movie. The whole idea of them going to this island. To tell you the truth, um, in preparing for this movie, I only watched the first one again. I did not watch the second one again. I did not watch either one of them. Mm. And that was my, 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 but again, Frank is like, well, I didn't see the other two, so I don't know if I can go. And I'm like, I, it's, it's a prequel. It just sets up the, the premise of the other two movies. So I don't think you need to see no, the other and, two. And really infuriatingly, um, it gives you, you know, it's not like you're going into this. Okay, day one, maybe I'll get some exposition as to what's happening. No, no. no. So no, if you're looking for that, just set up expectations because you're not going to get it. It's just set in the same universe. I mean, we could have a hundred of these movies day one. Yeah. Just to, from a different person's perspective. Um, you know what? I want we... I want day one, the CNN broadcast. That's the movie that I want to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
because you do get little hints of that with the fighter jets early on flying over Manhattan. But didn't the the other two movies take place like somewhere in like West Virginia? Well, they filmed the first movie in New Paltz, New York. So I can only imagine that it the first movie That's took right. place in New York. OK, upstate. Where, obviously. where is there an island? Where is there an island anywhere near? That's not Long Island. Yeah, I don't know. That's a stretch. So okay. so maybe they filmed in New York and it was supposed to be somewhere else. So. OK, because uh, Jaman Hunsu 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 is is giving getting big creds here as being in this movie. He's in it for like a minute and a half. He's not starring in this. The cat has more screen time. Let me do. OK, what, maybe we should talk news before right, we get yeah, into this. Because I have a lot, <laughs> a lot to unload about this movie. OK. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so let's go news. Wait, wait. Be, actually, oh, before we do, oh, let's also whatever. talk about what we're pairing. A yeah, we're already place breaking with, our uh, yeah. format here by not telling you what our backup movie is. And, and I want to say. Initially, I wanted to go full on uh, another alien invasion movie, which after we just heard that Donald Sutherland passed. So Invasion of the Body Snatchers would have been an interesting pairing. But you brought up Mel Brooks, 1976 silent movie, which is pretty spot on because <laughs> I, I popped it in. I, I rented the DVD from my library because it's available nowhere else. And the first two minutes are just silent and i'm like i thought there was at least music with this Was that in my head but it doesn't kick in until the uh the credits the until you see the 20th century uh yeah. that, that billboard yeah yeah we've got some stories about that one but that's on the back end mm -hmm. so let's go to the news uh and so speaking of mel brooks the man just celebrated his 98th birthday so happy belated birthday to yes. Mel brooks happy and birthday. As Danny Glover famously said in Lethal Weapon, I am too old for this crap. The man was 41 years old. 41. You and I are well past that. Mel Brooks, 98 years old, still out there working, still producing. They just announced Amazon and MGM Studios, along with Josh Gad, are in the works for Spaceballs, the sequel. Only 20-some wow. odd years later. Actually, maybe longer than that. Longer than that. What was that, 87? 87. So I wonder if they are going like a prequel route, like um, like the I'm actual thinking, Star Wars. I'm thinking if you're going to spoof, so anybody who doesn't or has never seen Spaceball, stop listening to this right now and go find a copy on VHS somewhere. So it skewed Star Wars, Star Trek, Aliens, a lot of the space movie stuff. Um, my guess is that they probably would lean into more like the sequels with Ray. Yeah, because you'd have to, because you do not want to replace your beloved actors from the first one that have unfortunately passed. Well, you have you have to do something because you're right. Rick Moranis is retired. Dick Van Patten's gone. Joan Rivers is gone. John Candy is gone. Mel Brooks. I mean, he's executive producing this, but I, I can't see him. I mean, we've got say. we've got Bill Pullman, Bill still. Pullman. So so take that, which you could bring back Lone Star in kind of like that Han Solo, Luke Skywalker legacy character. Bring him in to, to bridge the gap. Yep. And um, obviously Mel could play yogurt. Yeah. Yogurt. Very old yogurt. Uh, my guess is with Josh Gad attached to this, that he would play like a barf son or a mog. He looks like a mog even before he put the ears and fur on him. Jeffrey Tambor still out there. Hmm. Daphne Zuniga. I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, maybe Mel would be the only one who could lure Rick Moranis out of retirement. Who knows? Maybe. So apparently it's being directed by Josh Greenbaum. And I don't know who that is. But the two guys who are uh, writing the screenplay, uh, Benji Samet and uh, Dan Hernandez, along with Josh Gad, they wrote the screenplay for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem mm. and Pokemon Detective Pikachu, which we both okay. covered yeah. and enjoyed. And they're yeah. also working on a Lego Star Wars um, Rebuild the Galaxy. Um, I don't know if it's a mini movie or if it's a little TV show. I don't know. I'm pretty sure uh, Michael, Michael Winslow's uh, already out there limbering up his lips. So I'm intrigued. But at the same time, it's like, wow, yeah, it's it's been a while. So, 
Yeah. I guess we'll have to. Uh, but this but, is- it, but it is one of those movies that perseveres. So it's not like everybody's forgotten about it. You know, it's it is a cult classic. So I think there's still an audience for it. Yes. And outside of one or two jokes, and we'll get into this with silent movie, which is, you know, you're talking a movie from 1976. Some of the jokes don't hold up. Some of them are a little aged, you know, slapstick isn't what people really kind of lean into nowadays, but hopefully, hopefully they can do something good with it. Although, you know, and we'll talk about this with silent movie slapstick. Yeah. You could say it's childish, but that, was when we saw it oh, when we no, were no, kids. Don't get me wrong. Don't get yeah. me wrong. I personally love Slapstick. I'm still a guy that if I switch by channels in three studios are on, I have to watch it. Yeah. And I will laugh like I did when I was nine mm-hmm. years old. And there mm-hmm. was a scene in Silent Movie that my son just happened to be standing there. And I said, wait, Ben, watch. Just blew my mind when I was like six years old. And uh, he laughed just as heartily as I did. Yeah. So. Yeah, my son uh, as well. He loved good. all those bits. See? He loved yes, all those yeah. bits. So it does it does hold up. So anyways, uh, I thought that was interesting, especially because we will be talking Mel Brooks. So uh, we'll uh, keep an eye on that. So uh, other news, Terry Gilliam, who we haven't heard from in ages, is set to, uh, he's got a new movie coming out called The Carnival at the End of Days, in which Johnny Depp is set to play Satan Jeff Bridges is set to play God, and apparently the uh, setup, a comedy where God decides to destroy humanity because they have ruined Earth, and the only one trying to save us is Satan because he needs people in hell. Otherwise, he won't have a job for eternity, and Gilliam has described this as very expensive and very funny for those who like to be offended. Uh, Jason Momoa and Adam Driver also sent to star in this. So this sounds like a good omen. Well, although, you know, anything that Terry Gilliam, I think maybe 50 percent of the movies that he begins actually get made. So you think think we could still be talking about this five years from now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard uh, he's also working on a Don Quixote movie. (laughs) (laughs) And news from 1988. Right. Yeah, have you ever seen that? There was a uh, a making of, or I guess it's not, it's a demaking of. There's a documentary on on the, him trying to get that movie made numerous times yeah, over the years yeah. and how it just falls apart every time. So uh, that is set to, to start filming January of next year. Lots of time between now and then, so we'll All see right. what happens. So you're, so you're telling me I shouldn't hold my breath. Mm, we might we may actually see the Spaceball sequel first. So. Yeah, I just hope they bring back Colonel Sanders. What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so many. We've been jammed. Oh, all right. So let's go. That's my news. I don't know if you have anything. If you No, no. Although nothing. I did, I was extremely terrified by one trailer that I saw before A Quiet Place called Long Legs. Did you see oh, this? Isn't that the spider one? No. No, no. This is the uh, Nicolas Cage. Yes. Truly Listen, terrifying. He you're plays, already dragging me through the Maxine world here. So. He plays a serial. This looks like it's on another level. Um, and he's he barely plays, in the trailer. He's barely in the trailer because of what you do see of him looks completely terrifying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm very apprehensive about this one. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Even you're on a fence, huh? Yeah. You're like, all right, that, that, that's too much. I did see trailer for Smile 2. Wah, wah. Yeah, I thought the first one was stupid and this oh, one looks even stupid. But I'm watching it and I'm I was convinced that it was the Joker 2 trailer. I thought that girl was uh Lady Gaga at first. Well, I could see how you would think that, but I would have thought that if I didn't get the Joker trailer right before the Smile oh, 2 trailer. Oh, I didn't see I didn't get I didn't get the Joker. I yeah. didn't get the Joker trailer. I've yet to see it. Mm. It's a musical though, right? Well, I wouldn't say it's a musical. There's musical no. numbers in the trailer, but um it doesn't look like it's a musical per se say no gotcha okay looks very good and again you know just like the first one you don't know is this okay is this his reality is this like a fantasy i don't know which is fine i yeah you know i just go with it i did see a trailer for transformers one this is ridiculous wait whoa whoa, whoa. this this looks like this this looks like no better than paw patrol to me (laughs) it's how they became enemies I guess they were buddies. They were friends. Megatron before before he was uh, Optimus Prime. This is like name. this is this is uh you know Optimus Prime and his amazing friends. <laughs> yeah, I knew nothing about this, and I'm like, is this like a kid show? No, it's a movie. 
No, it's a kid's movie. That's what it is. It's really yeah, we, uh, can, we can pair it up with the Transformers movie. They, let me tell you, there's a lot of serious Transformer heads out there. And yeah. they, uh, if I was one of them, which I am not, I would be railing against this thing. I'd be like, what? It's just an attempt to get a whole new generation. It is. Absolutely. Doors. Absolutely. Right. It is. Like you said, just like, you know, you turn on uh, Disney uh, Junior and, you know, the little Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Then put it on that. Then put it on that. Don't make it. Well, maybe it's maybe <laughs> it's I don't know. I was I was interested. I was like, huh, okay. So I guess we're not covering it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, so let's go to New York City. Let's go to New York City. Are we caught between the moon and New York City? I think oh, we are. Oh <laughs> yeah. Christopher Cross. If he had shown up in there, that would have been fun. if if Arthur Dudley Moore had shown up in here. Dudley come on. Moore. He passed. Uh, you know, drunkenly uh, asking one of the aliens for directions. <laughs> You wash my penis. <laughs> Could you hold my drink, sir? <laughs> Liza Vanelli. Actually, we got Liza Vanelli yes. on the back end. Yes, we do. He shows up. I mean, yeah, that's Italian right there. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so A Quiet Place Day One. So this is a prequel. You know, I did, as I said, watched the first one. Yep. And these movies are like, there's chapter stops, like day 400, such and such, day this, day that. So it, you know, it's just a carry through of how these well, it's, movies it's set are up times. For like 28 days later, you know, you just same yes. universe, just same concept. But so so those of us that have seen Quiet Place Part Two, that was in one movie, you know, a prequel and a continuation of the yeah, first because movie. Up front, you see the aliens landing in their town, in the town that right. uh, Emily Blunt and um, yeah. okay. John Krasinski live in. Yeah. So and Who it's did not direct this, by the way. No, although, you know, he gets a story credit here because yeah. it's all it's, his, it's his. It's his universe. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, you know, we should take him to task with some of these uh, details. Um, <laughs> well, you went on record last episode that um, just just the premise that these are aliens that uh, are drawn to sound. And listen, even when there's not a human talking there's a lot of sound going on in there is movie. now that that's okay I, I can see that this was greenlit that's the elevator pitch that one sentence that you just uttered without much thought into anything beyond that so but it raises all these questions uh that have not yet been answered for most pressingly on my mind and yours is that after seeing this movie there is no way that any newspaper printing offices were in operation on day <laughs> right. one yeah no like i said unless it's ben franklin <laughs> out there and pressing each one in of the them. first movie he's got copies of every single new york newspaper on his desk it's sound be quiet for this movie 10 minutes into it yeah new york city is decimated decimated yeah. And they go out of their way. This makes no effing sense. They blow up all the bridges. Now, we all know Manhattan is an island, but you're going to tell me they only fell on Manhattan. They didn't fall in Queens or Jersey. Yeah, like they don't have a problem elsewhere. And we find out that they're somehow they can't swim. They're like the aliens from Signs. Crap, we landed on. The yeah, plant. that's what that blue water. stuff was. <laughs> right. Mm, blue stuff bad. So, so, yeah, so yeah. so the the background of what these things are and why they've come is in no way further explained. There's a throwaway scene that really, you know, gives more questions than it does answers. But, yeah, you still don't know if these things came on purpose, if it's an accident, if it's like a greater force that sent them. You don't know. It's it's no, no nobody it's, even attempts it's, to it's, ask no. that. No, it's no it's no different than, like you said, the, the, the five minute uh, setup in the second movie where you just yeah. see them invading. You know, the, the, the families are at a baseball game and you uh, assume that they're they're coming down on meteors, that that's what they you know, that's what's coming into the atmosphere. There's a weird sequence uh, in the middle of this movie where the aliens find like a pod that they rip open or eating. So is that yes, like their food I, I read uh, the director gave some indication as to what that was in an interview. So I have some information about that. Oh, so we have once to, we get to so it. So we yeah. have to do uh, numerous research in order to. Figure yes, we out do. What's going on. Yes. With Although he said that, you know, this was because he's thinking of future installments. Right. So he put this uh, he, in. You know what? As, get, the, get the first movie right before you start. Setting yeah. Up. Yeah. Because, uh, so the director, Michael Sarnowski. 
who directed Pig. I have not seen this movie. This, but that guess, was um, a Nicolas Cage. That movie. was another Nicolas Cage. Yeah. And apparently there is a pig in that movie. So he got this brilliant idea early on that um, this cat, like he pitched this movie that the cat would almost be the star of the movie. And, and the that, cat is because as an audience member, you are at all times preoccupied by where this cat is at any given point. So, okay, so let's just set up. So, okay. you know, what we are talking about will make sense to somebody. Hopefully you're not Does listening it? to this without <laughs> watching the movie itself, but just in case you are, um, it's a really easy setup. If you've seen the other two movies, um, the character that you're introduced to um, and her name. Sam. And, they call and, her Sam, but I guess her full name is Samira. So but Sam? I don't think they uh, I don't think they ever. Yeah, you got Sam and Frodo. <laughs> Friggin' we're going Lord of the Rings here. Just, um, played get... by Lupita Nyong'o. Um, Who is pretty amazing in this. Yes. I will say that she is, because she carries, besides the cat, there's one other actor, Joseph Quinn, who plays this British law student that kind of like latches onto her. It's, it's a three-person play. It Regardless is. of what's going on around all this crazy, chaotic crap, it's her. So we're introduced to her. And, and, and it is, like if that. you think about it, now that you've said, because I didn't even put that together. I knew the cat's name was Frodo, but yeah. um, I maybe blanked because I had to look up what her character's name was just now. Yeah. And they are on a mission, not to go to, to Mordor, but to yeah. get a slice of pizza. Get a slice of pizza, which on the surface seems ridiculous. But so we're introduced to her. She's in a therapy group. Uh, somewhere in Queens, maybe, or, or somewhere out in Long Island, because when they go into Manhattan, they go over the Brooklyn Bridge. And she's you find out that she is dying from cancer. Yes. And she's in a hospice. So she is in a hospice where yes. there are other terminal cancer patients. And Frodo, her cat, is her emotional support animal. Which it never leaves her side. No, this cat is unbelievable. And I guess when Sarnowski was pitching this, the studio's like, all right, well, I guess we're going to have a CG cat. And it's, no, 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 no. I want to use a real cat the whole way through. There's two cats that were used. This cat is a, re first of all, this cat never wants me out. My no, cat no, can't no, shut yeah. up. Let me tell you, as a cat owner, I was completely offended and baffled by the behavior of this cat in the movie. Because it's talk about Talk about that the cat is unbelievable. <laughs> it is literally unbelievable. First of all, the cat goes underwater fully yeah, he holds multiple his times. Thank you. Yes, yes. And now, yeah. if I were to even dip my cat's paws in water he would claw my eyes yeah. out to get yeah. out of my hands no matter how much this cat loves me and i would like to think that he does but because he's an emotional support <laughs> cat is he is he like conditioned i don't i i don't think that these exist you cannot train a cat like you can well they dog. did they did i mean but this is a movie this is a <laughs> I'm sure i would love to have a, like a movie trainer come to my house yeah. and train my cat but a normal oh. cat will not do these things my cat won't shut up between that there's no way that if this really happened i would live past day two i snore and fart in my sleep so right then <laughs> and there i'm gone but my that's cat a, doesn't that's my what, cat all day long cries my my wife asked how do they how do they hold it in when they're sleeping you know if i would love to see that scene it, just a throwaway character sleeping all of a sudden <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they just get eaten yeah <laughs> like all you hear is just a little <laughs> and then all the yeah. the aliens converge upon them well, there's that scene where these kids are hiding underneath the, the fountain. The fountain's making noise. Wouldn't it draw them there? Yeah. Like, or so, so wouldn't, many... wouldn't like the sound of thunder freak them out and they'd all be on the rooftop. They don't know what thunder is. And I guess they're kind of like T-Rexes because there's one point where Eric goes out to find her meds. And this thing is in his face. And like you said, it, it opens up where you can almost hear his harpy. And it's like, it's right there. He's yeah. Why can't why knowledge. can't he hear the harpy? Yeah. Where does the hearing, the super, super hearing stop? You know, because yeah. apparently they can't hear a stomach growling. They can't hear heartbeats. They can't hear like little shallow breaths, even when they're right on top of you. I, yeah, because yeah, there's a scene where they're in the water and she's stifling. He's sneezing. <laughs> Is that what was going on there? Because I really had a hard time knowing what was happening. If he was going to just lose his mind and start crying or if he was actually trying to stifle a sneeze. And we all know when you try that, it usually comes out the other end. And then you're dead anyway. <laughs> what I find more 
uh, unrealistic is that they made their way from Chinatown up to Harlem, which is roughly 11 miles, uh, to, go, to get to this Patsy's Pizzeria. I looked it up. There are over 1,800 pizzerias in Manhattan. They had to pass one like every block and a half. Well, that was her point, is that she wanted to go to this specific one because it was her favorite and it reminded her of her father. Well, I, I get the backstory. But there's a good chance you're not making it there. So uh, cut your losses, eat a slice of pizza. Well, well, that's the thing is I'll give them this plot point because she wasn't going to make it anyway because she's terminal. So she wanted to, you know, get some piece of herself back. Right. So this is when when uh, she gets dragged into the city. She she wants nothing to do with this group. She just wants to be left alone. The nurse uh, convinces her to get on the bus. They're going to see a play. And it turns out to be a marionette. I actually want to see more of this marionette show because this guy was pretty cool. The guy had the, the, the marionette blowing up balloons and it's floating away. I'm like, all right, this is kind of cool. I'm pretty sure the marionette did not make it. So, yes, the hospice goes on this trip to the show that Jeff just mentioned. So it's like a day trip into Manhattan. And um, as they're at the show, the leader of the group who's um, coordinated the trip for the group gets a call from, I guess, the hospice saying, you got to come back. There's something going on in the city. You and this, is, come why, back this now. is after we see the bus going over the Brooklyn Bridge and you do see fighter jets flying over yeah. Manhattan. Yeah. So you get a sense. But we, if you watch either one of these movies, you know what the setup is. You, you walked into the theater knowing that there's an alien invasion coming. But yet you don't see anything coming down when the fighter jets are assembling. No, no. which means that, you know, somehow NORAD had tracked them in space or maybe they had already landed somewhere else. Maybe they were making their way all, the, all across the U.S. And it was just now on the eastern seaboard. Right. Because it does look like, like uh, you know, meteorite shower. It's just these things flying down and crashing. And all of a sudden these aliens just come flying out. So they, they make it. Back onto the bus, but then the meteorites start coming down and the bus is like obliterated. And um, at this point is the first point where she loses the cat or the audience member loses where the cat is. Because you're thinking because she had the cat in the theater, like, where's that damn cat? That's what this movie should be called. That damn cat or that darn cat. (laughs) That darn cat. Yeah, because at various points she loses it, doesn't care where it is. Um, or they have to get it from a precarious position. It, there's no in between here. So she gets knocked out once she's thrown from the bus, and then she wakes up in the theater where there's a group of people shushing her already. So John Q. Public has already worked out in right. whatever the hour or so that this thing has started that they key off noise. Now, John Q. Public. I think for the most part, can't even tie their own shoes. So <laughs> let, let alone keep a, a theater full of people quiet. Yeah. How they figured out in that hour that they've got to stay silent. I don't know. That's that's done off screen. That's figured they, out oh, off screen. They read the script. So they're shushing her already when she wakes up. The government are pretty clueless because you hear some helicopters. I th- must there's be, some numerous stupid things going must on. Must be here. flying low because they take down the helicopters somehow unless the heli- they can fly. The, heli- the guys with the helicopter flying through and he's like be quiet be quiet <laughs> it's like you're in a helicopter like at the end of the movie they're all escaping in these ferry boats and the ferry boat is out in the water blowing his horn <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> that doesn't make any sense I'm like what and how did they manage to get on the boat without making noise i don't there's, there's a lot of and, and so right they they all had the they were being instructed to make their way down to uh, south street seaport which is on the east side of manhattan in the uh, East River. Mm. So you're not even, it looks like they're just trying to make their way across the Queens. They're not even going out the open ocean because they, they, they tell them these things can't swim. They can't, they can't go anywhere near water. And as an Easter egg, I think I saw Kramer from Seinfeld swimming in the East River. <laughs> he was in there? Yeah, with a bathing cap. <laughs> I don't know. I think the studio <laughs> missed an opportunity to just turn this cat into a flurkin. <laughs> and at the end, he just starts eating the aliens left and right. He's like, you know what? I'm done with this. There's a lot. Go- there's a lot going on and yet nothing going on. Yeah. Like, like you I said, said it's, it's a it's a two person, one cat play of them going from point A to point B to get a slice of pizza. That's what the movie is about. Not about the aliens. Yeah. Did you notice at one point she was in front of Argyle's bookstore? And I'm like, we must well just bring in a cat from Argyle. Mm-hmm. And then we can have, we can just, this is going to be like a road trip, a cat road trip movie. Because the cat is more interesting than um, 
the cat i get where they're going the cat is kind of like the last vestige even though i don't know where the cat came from i'm assuming that you know they went to a shelter and gave it to her like this cat is like her connection to get back like her like you said she wants to get back to this patsy's pizza real which is a real place by the way where her father played piano he was a jazz musician she has written books poetry she's a very well-known poet um but she just wants to get back to this Patsy's. They finally get there and it's burnt. There's nothing left. Because this relationship has built up between the two main characters during this journey. Um, he makes sure that she still gets what she wants. And well, she um, tries to get rid of him numerous times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, just leave me be. I, I'm on my own journey here. Yeah, but he's got nothing because, yeah. you know, as you said, he's an English yeah. law student and is he's got no family in the u.s so he's yeah. got nobody else to turn to did you um, notice he never once loosens his tie he wears a tie throughout this entire movie mm-hmm. uh but somehow her apartment is in between here and patsy's because she goes back to her apartment there's some good there's some nice character moments but it just i don't know it's just the the whole setup is you know as you mentioned last week full of holes that you just fall into at any step that you take during this. So if your brain is working, you know, beyond what you're seeing on screen, it just does not hold up. You know, it doesn't take afterwards for you to think of these things. You think of them as you're watching the movie. Yeah, there's a scene where they crawl down into the subway tunnels, which are flooded. And so all of Manhattan must be without power because that third rail would still be active. Mm. And you would just get electrocuted. Mm -hmm. But like you said, then they end up underwater for quite a few minutes. This cat knows how to hold its breath. (laughs) No, that cat would be pissed off coming out the other side. And like I said, Joseph Quinn would be short an eye when when they when they (laughs) if if the cat was still alive when he came when he came out of that. This cat is just super chill. It's almost like like a shaman, like like he comes out of the tunnel and he's in the water and he just sees the cat and he just starts following it. Yep. Like the cat is like shepherding him back to her. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I did read that uh, Lupito was afraid of cats, petrified of cats. So why'd you sign up to this movie mm-hmm. knowing that your your leading man is a cat? But that, you know, once working with these two cats, um, she loved them. Now, somebody should really break the news to her that this is not how cats behave. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go get my own cat. He's yeah. an a-hole. <laughs> Yeah, cats cats don't give a crap. Nope. So so now so this that's basic what we've already said is basically the movie. They have to go from point A to point B to get the slice of pizza. Unfortunately, we know, you know, because she's terminal, she doesn't make it to the end. She does what? make it to the end, but you know that um things are not going to work well, out you, for her. You, you know she wasn't going to make it when she gave the guy her sweater. No. And her cat. And, and her the, cat. And the cat. This is where so, you take the sweater, you wrap the cat in it, <laughs> so it doesn't claw you to death. So I guess if you're a cat lover, the most important information that you could be armed with going into this movie is, yes, the cat survives. Yes. You do not have to worry about that for an hour and a half. You know. Oh, before... I think they would have. I think people would have revolted if you killed <laughs> yeah. this cat. No, so, you... so let's let's talk about that scene. That scene where uh, Joseph Quinn's character goes out because Lupita needs some uh, meds. Yep. Because she's in pain, um, and she has no meds left. So he goes out by himself once they've made it to her apartment. Goes to the abandoned pharmacy to see if he can find what she's looking for. So he makes it there. You know, he makes his way quietly to the pharmacy, goes to the back. He's looking around and he realizes that Frodo the cat has followed him there. Um, So you're just throughout the movie, you're waiting for this cat to go. Never makes a sound. Just Just, like a dog follows him. Yeah. Um, So then as he he gets the, the medication, the cat runs away. He follows it and then he finds what can only be described as like a layer or something, you know, HQ for these aliens. There's these egg looking things, circular, like, you know, they're growing like pumpkins out of the ground. So you're thinking, oh, are these eggs? Is this like aliens? Yeah, right. And so Reproduce. he's very quiet. The, the cat, it, it's like a construction site and the cat climbs up on one of the girders. So he feels the need to go get it. Because he thinks that it's trapped. The damn cat followed you on its own <laughs> right. to the You're... pharmacy. It will follow you back. 
You do not need to climb the girders to retrieve it. But anyway, they see the aliens coming in and he's like, they're looking, he's looking at what's happening. The aliens come to these egg sacs, split them open and start eating them like cotton candy or something. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's not explained. Obviously, the alien's not going to stop and tell you what what this thing is. But after I saw the movie, I was looking online to see if anybody knew what these things were. And the director, inter- you know, he says, OK, for eagle eyed fans that watch this movie more than once, if you look in the background, there are pools of liquid, you know, not water because it's colored liquid. You will see bodies, human bodies in this liquid and these things are growing out of the liquid. So what he is suggesting is rather than eating the victims, they are farming them for whatever this thing is that they eat. So they need organic material to grow these things, which is their sustenance. This is, this is the cotton candy gun from killer clowns from outer space. (laughs) They wrap them up in a cotton candy cocoon and then drink their, their vitals. Yeah. With a crazy straw. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's, that I wanted that I'd pay money mm. to see. Just replace these aliens with killer clowns. And I'd so be... so they're interstellar farmers, I guess. Is <sighs> they come a long way. They can't they they can't. Well, I guess they're not immune to water. They just can't swim in water. So and then also the, the question is, is they've got the super hearing, right? Do they just want to stop noises that are being made? Is that why they go nuts when they hear a noise? I do get that. Okay, they're they're coming to get their whatever the seeds are, that that's what they need in order to grow their food. But they seem to be very agitated by noise. Whenever the car alarm goes off, they, you know, destroy the car to get the noise to stop. So you mean to tell me that nobody but John Krasinski figured out maybe if we play a loud sound, they won't like that. Nobody figured that out. Slim but Whitman. Yet it they took an, just played a Slim Whitman album. But yet it took an hour for John Q. Public to realize they're keyed on sound. But nobody in the government realized, OK, if we I play a loud it. sound at them, maybe they won't like it. Celine yep. Dion would kick yeah, that. That took 400 days for somebody to figure that out. I don't know. There's too many more movies to be made. Yeah. We can't we can't just resolve this. We did get pizza. It just wasn't from. Yeah, and it was uh, it was a few days old. It We've was only two pizza. days old, right? We've yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, uh, I'm assuming that getting that cat to eat the pizza was probably one of the hardest tricks to do. Maybe they Actually, put, um, you know, cat an- on it? An- anchovies on it. Ooh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. I did read um, Hollywood Reporter had a full interview with the director and all they asked were cat questions. Mm. <laughs> Every question that, was that's all cat. that's all I'd ask. <laughs> Obviously, like, right, so, you, you so know, you're not going to tell me you're not going to tell me whatever what these aliens are, you know, so I, I might as well, well just I ignore think, those. Yeah, questions. like you said, the premise is faulty to begin with. And after we watched the first movie again, my wife brought up a good point about the first movie, because you see the 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 opening scene where the youngest oh, child is killed taken, because yeah. he, you know, the he wants that toy spaceship. Yeah. So my wife asked. Why does the whole family have to go to the pharmacy? Why can't the husband just go and get the meds and come back? Why does he have to put his whole family in jeopardy by making them all go to the pharmacy, especially you think, when you have a young kid? Do you think we've ruined movies for ourselves by doing this <laughs> podcast where you just question? No, everything? I think we just this again is a movie with gaping holes in it. So you well, can't. Well, I will. But... Say, I'm going to say right now, I I really like the first movie. Uh, what's missing in this is the family dynamic that you get in that first movie, especially with Emily Blunt and uh, John Krasinski. It's, you know, the cat carries this, you know, the girl, the girl's terminal. Uh, we don't really know enough about Eric to care about him one way or the other. And you assume that if anyone's going to get killed, it would be him, but no, he survives with the cat jumps in the water and she draws the aliens, puts on her headphones, her Zoom. Was that like an old i? Yeah, that that looked that looked exactly like the iPod that I still own. Yeah. So there's no electricity to charge the um, anything, and yet she can power up her like plugged in. That well, thing. it's only you assume it's only like battery operated two days or three days. So if she hasn't used it, then yeah, there's still some juice in it. If there was only charged. it was like 24 percent when she plugged it in. OK, but she did plug it into that player. Um, it was OK. It was all right. 
Like yeah, I said, there's the two the, women know, behind me kept me distracted through the whole thing. I <laughs> really wish these aliens had come down and just eaten them. Stay home. If you're going to yep. sit there and talk to this, especially this movie, this type of movie that is silent for large parts and partials of this. There's no sound whatsoever. Yeah. Like I said, before we started to record, I saw this in the Palisades. So um, it was an early show. Thankfully, it was 10 a.m. on a Saturday. And my theater was pretty full. I would say it was maybe 45 percent full. And there was a lot of talking during the preview. So I was like, oh, mm, please. But ev- no, but my theater was, okay. except for the guy who had the loud plastic bag that he was eating from. Right. The theater was silent. Nobody spoke during yeah. the movie itself. Although I did hear some sniffles um, during the end when um, when Lapita was listening to the music and then she unplugged it. Oh, see, it didn't it didn't get me. I didn't get me in the feels. So uh, I did. Speaking of the, the concession, I did read that the first movie made a ton of money but the studio or the uh the theaters lost out because nobody was buying snacks because it was pretty much a silent movie but how would you know that it's not like you're buying snacks during the movie i guess there was a i guess there's enough numbers that were out there that concession sales were down during those movies Mm. i didn't buy anything i didn't need anything but this movie apparently outperformed the original, which was a hit in itself. That's opening night, opening night, it made 22 million on Friday alone. That is, it was the biggest opening day ever for this series. So the projections for it, the opening weekend are at 53 million. The high watermark of the series so far has been 50 million. So it's a hit. Wow. So coupled okay. with um, Inside, Inside Out 2, Out two. Yeah. we're having a resurgence at the box okay. office. Okay. Well, just wait a couple of weeks when uh, Deadpool oh, yeah. Wolverine drops. Mm-hmm. I, I imagine the theater is going to be chaos. Yes. And I will welcome that. I, I You want to get rowdy in that movie, then by all means, get rowdy. Mm-hmm. Just not so much that I can't hear what's going on. That's yeah, I all know. I there ask. Was, there were parts where I was like, I wish this was in closed. Camp. Or if you think that you're funnier than the movie, please. <laughs> hey, what are you saying? I keep my mouth shut. At home, so, it's a different story. But so, all right. So there was suspense. You know, there was edge of your seat moments here. Yes. But you're just questioning. You know, scene after scene. What? 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 You know, like you were alluding to. Why knock out the bridges? Right. That if, makes no sense. It made absolutely no sense. If now you've you're just got trapping to deal all with the humans. Things, now you're just trapping yeah. humans. Yeah. Unless these things know where the population centers are. So there's a lot more on Manhattan than there are elsewhere. That might make sense. But you're never told that. No. No, because you never get any, any, you don't, once, once the chaos un- unfurls, you don't get, you don't get, like you said, the, the, you know, the newspaper articles, you don't get any kind, except for the occasional helicopter flying over telling you to make your way to, you know, um, Canal Street, South Street Seaport, be quiet. That's it. They don't tell you anything else. They're not dropping food for these people. They're not trying to lure these things away. Yeah. And I want to know where these things, because maybe it's completely budgetary reasons, but these things go into hiding when there's no noise. So suddenly when there's noise, they come from everywhere, you know? But I will say budgetary wise, there's a, you see these monsters a lot more than you ever did in the other two movies. Or am I wrong? Yeah, well, well, you have to because you're in Manhattan, so you're going to yeah, have it's more. an invasion. But still, when you're having the quiet parts and they're walking down the street, there's not a monster to be seen. So I don't know if they're sleeping, if they're just like in buildings hanging out or or what, but... Once a noise is made, they come from everywhere, from windows and from where have you. So it's not like they're all in this one location where they're eating things. They're just, you know, just in hiding. I, I heard they were all on Broadway watching the Back to the Future um, <laughs> musical. Yeah. And like you said, there's, you know, at one point you see a, a bunch of these aliens, a horde go flying through. And then all of a sudden all these people just start showing like like thousands of people just wandering there were very reminiscent scenes of 9-11 that were you know people covered in dust and lower manhattan covered in plumes of dust and crap so but it's neither here nor there um it's it was interesting it's it's an interesting exercise to kind of show just one person's perspective like i said you could do this movie 20 times with a different person in manhattan with a completely different story but you're not getting anything 
you're not getting any answer. So day one doesn't tell me anything more than what the five minutes in part two showed me. Yeah. Yeah. They land, they land and they start eating people. It was yeah. interesting. I do think the, uh, the first movie is superior by far. I think if I were to choose of the three, you know, even with the, the plot holes considered, I did like this one. Okay. Just because of the locale. Which mostly, which is funny because most of this was filmed in London. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, that's that's 11 miles she's mm-hmm. tracking. Some suspenseful scenes, right? And some good jump scares. Uh, but the, the plot holes were hot and heavy, one after the other. So um, I don't remember what I gave the others, but I would go three. Out of five buckets, I would go three. I'm going to go just below you. I'm going two and three quarters. Mm. So it was interesting. I was happy to see it in the theater. Um, You want just alien mayhem, human existential crisis. Uh, (laughs) Mm. She just the angst of her just being resolved that she's dead one way or the other. So screw it. Uh, I'm I'm making my way back home and I'm going to have a slice of pizza. She's seeing it right in front of her, the end of the world. So screw it. I might as well have a slice of pizza. I just hope she's not um, lactose intolerant because that would suck. I did read on IMDb that there's claims that Patsy's Pizzeria in Harlem, which is where she was uh, making her way, is considered uh, to be the originator of the New York style pizza. And uh, I did my research. That is not the case. Hmm. They lied to us. But I guess you'll have to stick around for the concession to find out. Oh, well, speaking of such, you don't have to stick around for long because we're there. Uh, Yep. So again, if you if this is your the first time listening to this show, in between our features, uh, we go to the concession stand, and each week uh, one of us buys, and we bring a snack. And so, initially, with these two quiet movies, I'm like, ah, I, do I lean into the quietest snack, or do I just go the other end of the spectrum and the loudest, crunchiest, most smack, you know, morsel eaten uh, food I can fathom. And I was kind of drawing a blank. And then after watching this movie, I'm like, I, how can I not talk New York style pizza? Mm. So, which you can get in yeah. pizzeria. It is a, the, it is a, theater. it's a valid concession snack. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's where we're going. New York style pizza. New York style. This is, this is what she was uh, clamoring for. Apparently uh, Patsy's is um, world renowned for their New York style pizza. Um, but what you have to realize before we get to New York, we have to start with the Neapolitan style pizza, which was basically invented in 1889. Uh, King Umberto the first and Queen Margarita of Savoy were visiting Naples and, uh, Naples decided they were going to honor these people, um, and the queen by making this, uh, this treat. And they used red tomatoes, white mozzarella, and green basil leaves to represent the Italian flag. And this is known as your classic Neapolitan pizza Mm. to this day. It is also referred to as a margarita pizza because of the queen's name. Okay. So, New York style pizza kind of grew out of the Neapolitan style. Uh, When uh, Italian immigrants uh, came here especially New York City, in the early 1900s. Um, and I want to say that, that by and large, pizza up until that point was low income, a cheap meal. It was peasant food. So what about, so, so if, if the margarita pizza was actually named after the queen, yep. whose grandma is the grandma pizza? That's a good question. After. I don't know. <laughs> You're already asking questions I can't answer. (laughs) I tried to keep this as concise as possible. I'm talking about the entire history of New York style Mm. pizza in like a two minute segment here. Understood. Um, understood. You want to you want to go grandma pizza? (laughs) I I think grandma pizza is actually pretty close to a margarita, is it not? I think you're right. Yeah, because it's it's not. Yeah, because it's not shredded cheese. It's mozzarella uh, like slabs. Slabs with and with like you know chunks of tomato rather yeah. than uh, you know chunkless sauce, right? So, so what's interesting is again this this is peasant food because um, the cheese and the tomatoes were were dirt cheap. Anybody could make dough back in the day, and they would just leave it out and let it rise. But people used to think that tomatoes were poisonous, so like the upper crust people wouldn't touch them. 
So it was left to peasants to just, well, we got tomatoes. Let's make something out of that. If you go to New York and you ask for a slice of pizza, you either, it's referred to as plain, regular, or simply cheese pizza. Okay? Okay. And it's and so it was sold by the slice or as a whole pie. And again, I think that's a regional thing, which if you go and you ask for a, a large pizza, you can just say, I, I want a pie. Okay. Normally, they're typically 18 inches, uh, cut into eight slices. So, so Lombardi's um, in Little Italy, which is a neighborhood in Manhattan, in 1905 is credited with opening the first pizzeria. And they would sell these slices for five cents. In 1924, Antonio Totono Pero left the shop and opened his own pizzeria, Totono's, in Coney Island. And Patsy's in Harlem, which we just discussed in this movie, uh, opened in 1933. So Patsy's was on the tail end. It was not the first pizzeria, as uh, IMDb would like you to believe. All three restaurants are still open today. Mm-hmm. You walk in there and you can get a uh, New York style pizza. And again, we can we can get into the nitty gritty if you prefer Detroit over Chicago. Um, it's it's a regional thing. Even upstate New York, where I I grew up. Pizza was Pizza Hut. We didn't really have pizzerias back in the day. So pizza, as an American food, is pretty new. It's not, And again, it started out as peasant food. Uh, but it really kind of took off in the 1900s, early 1900s. And it only became popular after World War II, when um, soldiers were coming back from uh, overseas when they were stationed in Italy. So then they were kind of craving. They were like, oh, yeah, they made this little dish over there called pizza. And now you can't avoid it. Every small town has like three competing no. pizza places. Yeah. Well, that's why I was joking that, you know, here they are in Manhattan. 1,800 pizzerias in New York City. If each pizzeria slings an average of 50 pizzas a day, which is conservative estimate, considering the sheer pizza consumption power of New Yorkers, that's a whopping 90,000 pizzas dished out daily. And depending on depending on where you go, it's there are differences. Yes. Well, one of the one of the the claims with the New York style pizza is the water. Now, I know family members who own um, bagel shops and they claim they import the water from Manhattan to make these bagels because there is a difference in the, the, the whatever is in the water makes a difference in the taste. So I would assume that, that you know, the, the same claims. Levels of toxicity, perhaps? Could be, right. <laughs> Microplastics that we've been consuming since uh, birth. Uh, so your ingredients are pretty simple. You got sugar and olive oil are usually added to high gluten bread flour, mm-hmm. yeast, and then the water to create the dough. And whatever is whatever is on the hands of the person that's kneading the dough. <laughs> I, because I don't think I've ever gone to a pizzeria where someone's wearing gloves. <laughs> but that's where the extra charm comes from, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. And then depending, I mean, you could go across the street and have a completely different tomato uh, sauce. And uh, there's or some, there's if some... they if they add more salt into it than somebody else, or if they add some ingredient that somebody else doesn't. Well, do you ever have the argument with family that uh, if there's meat in it, it's it's actually called gravy? No. Italians, Italians refer to, if you call it a sauce and there's meat in it, you will be kicked out of the family. Mm. It is a gravy. No, gravy is brown with mushrooms. I'm sorry. <laughs> so do you have a preference yourself? Is there uh, a pizza place that you will go before any other? I actually crave pizza down the street every now and again, but I do, can't do, tell you Do you time. still have one? Do, do you still have I a do. pizza hut? I do. We do. I do have a pizza hut. It's wow. in, it's in a it's in a uh, a strip mall. It's like a little strip mall. It's not like its own standalone pizza hut because they're really hard to find anymore. They like are. Right up there with friendlies or not. I don't think know. we have one local to me yeah. anymore. Really? Yeah. yeah. In terms of of like fast food pizza like that, I prefer Little Caesars to pizza. Hut. I have never had Little Caesars. Oh, you life. your eyes would open wide if you had really? Little Caesars. Yeah. Hmm. Now, see, we have uh, what they upstate uh, pudgies, and they sell cheap pizzas. So probably a big, you know, rectangle. I think Pizza Hut does the same thing now. Probably pizza connoisseurs are like are. But that's fine. Cursing have, at us we, in, in we disbelief. We have a couple. We have a couple pizzerias around here, and my wife and I prefer um, 
sausage and onion. Uh, I'm sure you can guess what the uh, number one uh, topping in the world is. If you uh, pepperoni. Guess. Pepperoni is the most popular pizza topping. About 251.7 million pounds of pepperoni is consumed annually. You see, I, I will eat that, but it's too greasy. If I have the choice, I would uh, just go straight cheese. Well, or yeah, meatball. I, I, I prefer meatball to pepperoni. I want meatballs. We actually have another pizzeria across the street that makes uh, what they call um, the Big Mac. And it is basically a Big Mac in a pizza form mm. with ground burger and shredded lettuce and their special sauce. My favorite local pizza place is actually a Greek pizza place called Four Brothers, and they have various locations here in the Hudson Valley. I believe they use feta in their cheese, oh, which, interesting. which sets it apart. It's amazing. Amazing. Hmm. Yeah. I We used to do what I would refer to as a garbage pie, which is at the end of the week or whatever, all my leftovers went on a uh, pizza, and we would just cook it up and eat it. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, more than 93% of Americans order a pizza at least once a month. Is that, I'm going to say, on average, especially now that I got two 20-year-olds home and all their friends, we will order three or four pies. Whatever's left over gets thrown in a freezer, and you just yeah. put it in a little pizza I, stone. Uh, this family, even though there's only three of us, once a week, we get okay. a medium pie. Yeah, I'm not quite that. But I do like Sicilian. I do like the, the Detroit style. I like the thicker. Mm. But I can't eat it all the time. And like you said, the pepperoni is, uh, the older I get, more my body resists it. Right. I'm partial, you know, um, even more so than the regular cheese pie. I like the white pizza. Okay. And yeah, I would say Sicilian is um, okay. is up there with me too. Yeah, I do. I do like a good Sicilian gotta be cooked right though you get the raw dough in the middle forget it yeah and the grandma right. pie and the grandma pie as long as it's you know there's just got to be just enough chunk to it if it's too chunky then it's eh. but <laughs> just enough just enough of a chunk <laughs> just enough of a chunk yeah and i'm not talking chunk from uh, goonies either i'm talking uh, the tomato chunks. <laughs> to the truffle shovel <laughs> um, yeah, so fun facts. Yeah, that, that's what I have to do when I go to my pizza place in order for them to get in order me the, pizza. Yeah. I will tell you, we ordered two two large pies the other day, and it set me back 55 bucks. Yeah, it's not cheap. Hey, it's not no, cheap it's anymore. Not. No longer. No it's no longer, longer peasant uh, food. Peasant food. They're so have you, ever, have you ever actually ordered pizza from your concession stand? No. No, neither no. have I. It's, it, to me, it's not a... If I had a table, if I was like at the Alamo Draft House or someplace where I actually had... I'm not putting a greasy box. It's bad enough, the you know, the bucket of popcorn because I tend to get extra butter. If it starts leaking on your lap, forget it. You got to put that layer of napkins in but there. But and... how about the concession stand at the drive-in? As a kid growing up, we never, I think I walked into the concession stand once in my life. Really? We would. We See, would because, that's an experience but, in itself. That's an that experience in cheap, itself. But that was, that was like, you could go $5 car load. So we would load up, but what we would do is literally make a paper bag filled with homemade popcorn and bring it. Because the concession stand in my local drive in. I think for 10 years, still had the same coming soon movie posters right. up there. <laughs> right. So, for example, for the entire the, the entire 80s, the original uh, National Lampoon Vacation movie poster really? was up in my ah, concession stand. Painted by but Boris Vallejo. I think maybe I could count on one hand the times I bought pizza from the drive-in concession stand, but more often than not, I would sneak pizza from elsewhere into right. the drive-in. Yeah. Now you could probably get it door dashed. <laughs> you probably could. You probably could. Yeah. Uh, so Pizza Hut often records selling over 2 million pizzas during Super Bowl, which I guess makes sense. I'm yes. sure they probably sell a lot more wings. Uh, Americans consume, on average, 350 slices of pizza every second. Every that's second? The, every second. That's so somebody's cool. eating pizza right now. Even though it's 10 a.m. in the morning right oh, now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. Just uh, you, you saw them eating a the cold pizza in that movie, and you're like, we've all done that. Cold pizza is actually pretty solid. 21,000 slices a minute is mm -hmm. what it comes down to. They actually use this equivalent to 100 acres of pizza. And I'm like, who's measuring acres by pizza slice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just mentioned that pizza has gone up exponentially, you know, obviously with, you know, pricing and whatnot. So this average slice of, of 
slice of pizza in Manhattan is equivalent to the price of a subway ticket. So as subway tickets go up in price, so do pizza slices. This is actually referred to as the pizza principle. <laughs> so it used to be able didn't, to, uh, didn't, I, didn't Janet Jackson have that as a song on one of the, her uh, the pizza album? principle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's uh, Miss Jackson, if you're hungry. <laughs> um, he, uh, so you used to be able to get, I think it was two slices plus a soda for two fifty when I when I worked in Manhattan. I don't think you can come anywhere near that now. I'll grab two slices of pepperoni at my deli on my route, and it costs me five and change, which is actually pretty cheap. And they're pretty sizable slices. And like I said, we have a pizza stone. Throw that thing in the oven, you, you, you bang it up to 500 degrees. So, so are you one to eat the entire slice and not leave the crust? Of course. I was taught you clean up your food you eat everything and there's no leftovers in my house so if, if we're making dinner and my wife can't finish her piece of chicken you're damn straight that one of my kids or myself are gonna eat that because my kid generally leaves the crust so i'm hovering over his plate like a yeah. like a vulture well, that's my wife yeah yeah i'm waiting i'm waiting for my wife to be full after her second slice <laughs> she's like oh i can't eat anymore well, uh you gonna you gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, eat, you're gonna, that? You're gonna you're eat, eat that, that? you're gonna eat that yeah yeah uh i know uh, like I said, the buffalo chicken is really popular in my house, and um, Skyler prefers ranch dressing, dunk, okay. and uh, the rest of us will go blue cheese. So, uh, so the most expensive pizza in the world was created by this master chef Renato Viola of Italy. It is referred to as the Louis the Eighth, and it costs twelve thousand dollars. So suddenly, your twenty-two dollar pizza. Not so bad. What does it have? It, gold, gold flakes on it or something? You would think so. It's topped with lobster, three types of caviar, buffalo mozzarella, pink Australian salt, and squillamantis, which I actually had to look up. These are like these freaky-looking little shrimp. You couldn't. I, you'd have to pay me to eat these things. <laughs> I remember being in a, in, a, in a Chinese restaurant down in uh, Chinatown once, and these little things are swimming around in a tank, a fish tank, and they would scoop them out and cook them. They look like those little creepy crawly bugs that you kill when it crawls out of your sink drain. Oh, that's a, that's a great segue, actually, to silent movie. Do you, are, do you know what I'm talking about? That creepy scene with the lobsters? No, the scene with the lobsters that was cut. That was cut. And I, okay, let's get into that, because there's a movie that either has that scene or it's just like the mandela effect that i all right remember. should we leave the are you done yes. with the pizza okay. i am done with the pizza i hope that uh, i brought enough uh, new york style pizza information to your table yes you did that was fun okay. and now i want pizza yeah like i said trying to come up with something that was like either the loudest snack i was gonna go like corn nuts and i'm like who eats corn nuts <laughs> i couldn't even talk about them because i've never had one well, well, even a soda would be loud because they load that up with ice at the movie theater. If you're not doing it yourself, true. if you're not at the self serve, yeah. Do you ever try to try to eat one of those uh, frozen slurps? Or you've got the sound of the straw <laughs> just, <laughs> running up and down the top of the. All right, all right. silent movie, yeah. silent movie, silent movie. So we were all over the place last uh, episode trying to guess what year this was, and at the last second, I think I threw out seventy six, and that is correct. You because, were correct. Because yes, the, this movie. There's a handful of movies that stick in my brain at a very, very specific time in my life. And in doing research for this, so this 76, right in between Jaws and Star Wars. So it was, was like kind of like an open field, this this one year in between the two blockbusters, right? So Kong at one point, you know, took up residence yep. for a few months, right? As yep. a big box office hit. Uh, Rocky was in there in between the two. So yeah, maybe that yeah. bit could be considered. And so was this. This was a hit in the summer of 1976. Now, I never saw this in the theater. Oh, no, I would. I would have been five years old when this came out. Right. So what what I do remember and in doing my research, I was tickled pink to find this. And I did send you the link. There is uh, a website referred to as the Internet Archives that has an extensive collection of PDFs of those original HBO guide booklets that you used Which, to get. Yeah, if you were a, a sus subscriber. Yep. Yeah, you'd get like a little, almost like having a subscription to your own personal TV guide for HBO. Yeah, and that was cable. That was the only movie 
station that you got. And it was a little, maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 page booklet at the most full color. And it had a full guide every day and it would highlight all your movies that were coming out. And it would tell you the dates that they were playing. Yeah. For the month. So you'd have your whole viewing yes. set there yeah. in that guide for a whole month. And like you said, like when you used to get the TV guide and go through it and just circle everything like this was, and I remember specifically the cover with the Hindenburg, the cover with uh, Black Sunday, the cover with Day of the Dolphins, all these movies that kind of fell in that window that I must have watched. I, I'm assuming that my parents just left me in front of the TV or <laughs> at too. least a good I'm, I'm, I'm guessing probably like a two year window. This was yep. right right around the time my parents divorced. But these movies are ingrained in me and I had to have seen them numerous times. So I looked it up. It premiered on HBO June 1977. And now this, of course, we're talking about watching TV all day during the summer months. So this would have been right in that sweet spot yeah. where you're watching reruns of A Family Affair. Then, oh, I got to watch Silent Movie at uh, at 1230. And then Magic Garden comes on oh, after that. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> So yeah, these movies, Duchess and the Dirtwater Fox, uh, the, you know, this movie, Silent Movie, there was there was just a, a window of these movies that are just etched in my brain. I know them inside and out. And, and I most of to... them would star uh, or be directed by Mel Brooks, Gene Wilder, Richard Pryor. You know, th yeah. this was the rogues gallery mother, that you mother, keep mother seeing. Mother Jugs and Speed. Yeah. Uh, not a kid's movie by any means. No. Mandingo. But if it was Weird if it was PG, movies. if it was PG, you would see it during the day on HBO. Yeah, you're right. They did. They did wait and show those R rated later. Yeah. Yeah. So this was 47 years ago. Mm. So we are right now, June of 1977. This just dropped. We are at the tail end of June, uh, dropped on HBO. Uh, and like you said, Mel Brooks. And of so, course, if you were familiar with and what kid wasn't at you know any age, young Frankenstein, you knew who Mel Brooks was, just at least the name. And you knew who Marty Feldman was because of those eyes. You'd never forget those eyes the first time you see him. But I think this is pro I think I probably saw this movie long before I ever saw Blazing Saddles or. Young Frankenstein, which both those movies came out two years prior. Yeah, 74. I would think that I probably was became aware of these movies at around the same time. Yeah. But like like you said, Marty Feldman, uh, you know, iconic, uh, you know, last remake of Beau Jest, uh, you know. Uh, some of these other movies that he's in, Young Frankenstein, obviously, Dom DeLuise. Yeah. And it took this movie for me to know who Burt Reynolds was. Oh, or or, well, or who Smokey Liza Minnelli Bandit. was. Well, Smokey and the Bandit was big that year. Was, but this movie, this movie was telling me he was a big star. So that's how I knew it. It wouldn't yeah, have necessarily like, been because of Smokey and the Bandit. Every one of these people are dead, by the way. Oh, except Bernadette Peters. See, Bernadette and Peters Mel. And Mel. Taken. I know. Like I said, this. Uh, think of all the people that this man has worked with in his life. And they're gone. Mm. And he's still here. 98 years old so and yeah it, this this is a silent movie it's literally a silent movie there's one line of dialogue in this entire thing well my son as well during the opening scene with the you know the pregnant woman joke who, um, you know that that is uh dom deloise's wife right and and by the way i had completely blanked that Anne bancroft was mel brooks's wife so i think but not during this were they already married? No, they were. 64, oh, they, were. they got married. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't think I realized that. Yeah. So when she was uh, Mrs. Robinson, they were already married. Huh. Okay. But yeah, my son says to me, uh, are they going to talk during this? I'm like, did you not see what the title of the <laughs> yeah, movie was? Right. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about the fact that Young Frankenstein is a spoof of monster movies. Blazing Saddle is a spoof of Westerns. So this is a spoof of silent movie. And at that point in time, you know, these people were old enough to have experienced actual silent movies as kids. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they grew up with uh, Charlie Chaplin and, uh, you know, you said you got the DVD, but I had a from my library, a Blu-ray box set of okay. Mel Brooks movies. And there were some special features talking about uh -oh. the genesis of silent movie. And that was exactly the case. They were it was like a love letter 
to Buster Keaton and to and all those stars. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and they were slapstick because you could, you know, the dialogue had to be pretty cut and dry because you just had, you know. Had these quick card, you know, card. quick cards that you'd have to read quick and then they'd be off the screen. Yeah, you figure the first silent movie was 1903, which was a great train robbery. So this is only 73 years into it. So I don't know when talkies came in, maybe the 20s, 30s, probably late 20s, early 30s, I'm sure. And right. um, but then it just engulfed everything. Speaking of uh, silent movie and yeah. golf and devour, but um, golf and devour. But it's funny because I think this is this plays into the idea that a lot of these actors who were very famous silent movie actors couldn't carry it over into talkies because you got these beautiful women who talk like this. <laughs> and you're like, no, it's not going to work, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> all of a sudden they were out of a job. Or, you know, all these actors that um, just knew how to work physically couldn't make I mean, the transition. I mean, I mean, you know, like I said, Three Stooges uh, did a pretty damn good job of carrying that through uh, Laurel and Hardy. You know, a lot of these guys, even if the Marx Brothers, you know, carrying that physical slapstick shtick. Even like oh, we talked about Steve Martin, you know, last episode. Yeah. Kind of has that little bit of uh, je ne sais and, quoi, and I guess. Speaking, that... speaking of Steve Martin, um, I always felt that the Muppet movie borrows heavily from silent movie plot wise. You know, it's OK. Yep. It's a road trip where they're yeah, trying, trying to, to get a movie, trying to get a movie together. You are correct. Yeah. That was only two years later. Seventy eight. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm, already ripping off Mel Brooks. <laughs> but this is this is fun. So imagine, you know, because this is the pitch in the movie is that we're going to make a silent movie and it's going to be silent. So imagine him actually going into a real studio. Well, that's like, what he says in the interview, because Mel is being interviewed on the bonus feature. He's like okay. that scene with Sid Caesar was me pitching this movie. And Sid Caesar is genius in this because yeah. he comes from that world where it's slapstick. You know, my eyes are going googly and I got the pill on my tongue and it's like, like stuff like that just tickles me. There's a scene in this movie that I think really defines my sense of humor as a little kid to this day. And that is the scene in the carousel where the horse lifts his tail <laughs> and the and the cube poop comes out. <laughs> and I couldn't wait for that scene. And my son just happened to be here. And I'm like, Ben, Ben, watch this, watch. I said, this, this tickled me to no end. And he laughed as much as I did. And I'm like, it still holds up. That th There are some jokes in here that don't hold up well. Uh, you want to be, you know, we talked before about being easily offended. This It's an equal opportunity uh, uh, offender because they hit every, you know, whether it's alcoholism or homophobic or, or the mentally disabled or handicapped or very misogynist, but it was 1976. But I guess even this, so he was pretty prescient, this idea of, you know, these huge conglomerates looking to take over Hollywood studios. I mean, we're still talking about this to this day. Well, this is taken right from, you know, headlines from back then because Gulf and Western had bought a, uh, Paramount, Paramount, I think. Paramount, yeah. So, and Gulf and Devour is based on Gulf yes. and Western, I believe. So, you know, how so, yeah, could it not so it's, be? So it's a little inside baseball. It's a little inside Hollywood, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Coming at this, I haven't seen this probably since I saw it on HBO because I don't think this was like played readily no, on regular like TV. Like I said, this, this movie is etched in my brain, but yeah. I have not seen it in years. So the two scenes that I remember... Okay. most from being a kid watching this were the pong scene and Sid oh, yep. on, with the pill <laughs> on the tongue. Yep. Right. The other one was the, the boner joke with the, oh. <laughs> with the table slowly. Right. <laughs> Baba boom. Is Vilma. And yeah, rightly so and with goes, Bernadette goes, there. Rightly so. He goes back to that. even in the uh, history of the world, part one. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, yeah, <laughs> good old boner jokes. They never go out of style. So, yeah. so yeah, so Mel Fun has to convince the studio chief, Sid Caesar, that, yep, he's going to do a silent movie and you're going to bankroll it because I'm going to get the biggest stars in the movie. And that's what Mel had to actually say in order right. to get them behind him. Yep, I'm going to have the big stars in it. So, and then yeah. they agreed. And then they finally yeah. agreed. But we don't, we never know, like, 
uh, Dom DeLuise's character or Marty Feldman. They're just along for the ride. They you don't, don't know, seem like you, you know their names. It's um, Bell, Bell and, and Eggs. Eggs. Dom Bell and Marty Eggs. But <laughs> yeah. but they're not associated. Like you just like they're just friends of his. Yeah, that's not and, like they're like the producers said, or they're the editors. No, no or they're not actors or anything. They're just there for comic relief. Yeah, and you have to wonder. What the hell was Marty Feldman wearing? Like he's just wearing like this this one piece jumpsuit with a wacky helmet and scarf, and you're just like, all right, is this to like downplay his googly eyes? Like <laughs> he's just the scene where he's hitting on the nurse after they drop the uh, the pregnant woman off at mm-hmm. the hospital, and it's clearly Mel Brooks says, "You dirty son of a," and. They also the title card comes up and says, You naughty boy. And I'm like, that's not what he said. That's not what he said at all. So what I want to know is, and I was unable to find this, did they film this in sound? Is there a copy out there of them actually talking? Well, Do you bother with a boom mic. Yeah, action? why would you need to? I don't know. Why that's... why pay some guy to do that if you're not gonna use it? My guess is that they didn't, but it just, yeah, I guess if we're filming it in silent, we don't need to worry about sound at all. Like you can watch large parts of this and not have any title cards and still understand what's going on. You know, you don't need to have them explain that Engulf and Devour is this big studio and this guy's a jerk. And Ron Carey, this might have been his one of his first movies. Let me tell you, I was just looking at the credits at the end and a joke unto itself is the second assistant director's name, Ed Teets. This this cheats. guy, <laughs> this guy was probably ridiculed as a kid. Oh, I feel bad for poor him. Ed. Poor Ed. <laughs> I hope he's not poorly. He? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta milk him. But you would think they probably filmed just goofy scenes or whatever. And all right, this works. This doesn't. Like I said, that 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 one scene. It's clearly the title card is not matching up what he says, but. Um, it's just it's just psych gag after psych gag. There's yeah, whole- and, and a lot of it is like you know once the the setup is made that we need to get this movie made and we need to get the big stars to do it. It's like you know getting the band back together. It's you know like the Blues Brothers. That's this yeah. is what they do in the Blues Brothers as well. They go to each individual band member to convince them to sign on for this show. And they have to go to each big star here right. in order to convince them to sign on for the movie. The first one is Burt Reynolds. And the shower scene is <laughs> just off the charts. And, and, you know, and again, like you said, these we're being told these are like the biggest names in Hollywood. Yeah. Even though we didn't really know who Burt Reynolds was. Deliverance, maybe the year before. Well, Before as, as you bandit, said, he was the smoking the bandit like that year. I think the longest yard was before Gator was before. But yeah, you wouldn't have known. OK, all right. So Which, I had to tell my son, like these were actual big stars then, even yeah, if you real, don't know who they yeah. are. You know, after they drop the you know, they're in the they're in the car and there's like all these sight gags with the, the Taylor's uh, shop and, and the acupuncture. Like they're throwaway jokes. They don't all stick, but they're silly. And as a kid, you just. You know, you're yeah. tickled. It's like, oh, like, the guy like walked the, out of the acupuncture shop and you still got needles all sticking yeah. out. Yeah, or or the hot and spicy restaurant and everybody's you know steam Steaming. coming out of their mouths. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, and there's a repeat gag that happens numerous times that carries the whole thing forward with the um, the newspaper vendor. Yes, yes. And the, and the bully guys that come with the with a bundle of newspapers and throw it at him, and, and they try gets, to hit him. Yeah, they it try to hit him. With, worse. Yeah. that is he's he's been in pretty much every Mel Brooks movie. That is uh, Liam Dunn, who was uh, in Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, mm. and he is the um, he's the judge at the end of What's Up Doc. That turns out to be oh, Barbara, really? Barbara Walters, uh, Barbara but, Streisand's uh, dad. But not only is that visually a running gag of him getting hit with the newspapers but every time then after those scenes you see the spinning newspaper headline yeah and and the sub headline is newspaper vendor hit yes, with correct. newspapers yeah those are actually more fun to watch than the headlines themselves <laughs> <laughs> which come and go um and i will say my my dvd was pretty clean oh my blu-ray looked fabulous did it because my son was like when my son asked me when does this movie come out because this looks like it's at least in the 80s that it looked so good yeah and then we go off to james khan which is another yeah the the, the shtick of the 
the the trailer spring because the trailer. it has a spring broken, so it's moving from yeah. one. You know, it's it looks like they're on a, a rocky yeah. boat. And that's yeah. actually the the second link. So each each newspaper gag shows hey another big star signed on, and the uh, the headline for that newspaper Doc claims LSD can cure alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> And you also, this is where you get the two very homophobic, unnecessary jokes of the women making a, a homophobic yeah, slur when they they think that they're the, the main characters are in a compromising position. And I was yes. like, you know what? I I would actually be OK if they edited that out, you know, for for yeah. contemporary audiences, because that just made me cringe. Yeah, no, there's there's like I said, there's, there's a couple that just don't hold up. So, yeah, but they are a product of their time. Howard Hessman is one of the uh, execs in the uh, boardroom. Oh, really? Yeah, he's not really. You have to look for him. But he was he had to have been in WKRP at Cincinnati at the time. I don't I think that that debuted in 77 or 78. Okay. All right. Yeah. So he was right on the cusp. Yeah. So. Um, then there's the scene with the 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 mix up with the dogs and the the one seeing yeah, eye dog. The <laughs> the seeing eye dog. And yeah. <laughs> Uh, and even like there's a there's a, a jacket gag that is like straight out of vaudeville. It's like yeah. straight out of a Laurel and Hardy. Um, and yet it's funny, you know, when they're trying to court Liza Minnelli and they, they they're yeah. dressed in knights in armor and they're falling all over the place. And you have to assume that they're doing their own stunts there, because at one point you can clearly see it is Mel Brooks in that suit. So they're up. They're up for it, man. They 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 were game for pretty much everything and anything. Yeah. And then there's the the big uh, and Bancroft dance number where they're hitting her head on every available surface right. as they're dipping her and so that was funny and then of course you get the marcel marceau famously which i would have lost on who wants to be a millionaire because i swear that the one word he says is bs <laughs> i as a kid i remember uh, specifically i used to throw that out there as a as a fun fact and that's not the case he says no he says, what do he say? I don't know. I don't speak French. <laughs> but that's after he comes into the windy room and has to make his way. Which is what, you know, all mimes do. But sure. the way that they filmed it, there's actual wind. There's yes. like an. <laughs> yeah. it, it, that was just funny all around. Does he just hang around his house in makeup? I think he must. So, And then there's the infamous Sid Caesar with a pill, you know, flicking out his tongue with a pill on it. And that's where they see Paul Newman, who's probably the, you know, arguably probably the biggest star that they got sure. at the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they they had to play up the joke that he was, you know, a race car enthusiast where they have the racing scene of him in his wheelchair because he had broken his leg in a move on a movie or something. But the funny thing is, is that all of these stars, you know, I don't know who they think that these people are that are chasing them. But at the end, aren't you Mel Fun? I want to be right. in your movie. You know, they hey, don't I, even have right, right. to yeah. ask. I just it's saw all, that newspaper article yesterday. It was only it was only Bert that they had to actually uh, coerce to, to to get in the movie. And then, of course, we get the Bernadette Peters character, Vilma. Vilma Kaplan. Who was sent by the conglomerate to seduce Mel into maybe, I don't know, reverting him back into being an yeah, alcoholic. Yeah, there's a, there's a running joke that he's a recovering alcoholic. That's funny. Mm. <laughs> And he goes off. The, he goes off. the. Like, he falls off the wagon. But I'm like, filming starts tomorrow. Like, what was the, what was their end game? What was she supposed to do? <laughs> Keep uh, him in bed so he doesn't show up on I, set. I don't right, know. Right. Correct. Yeah. 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 But, you know, there's again, there's a running joke. Where he goes into the liquor store and he buys the big, you know, the big display bottle. And then there's the big Bernadette dance number where she rolls her hip and knocks the entire restaurant over. <laughs> ba -ba -loo. And another big laugh from this viewing was when uh, Mel is in the depths of his uh, regression and he goes to the sleazy hotel. Yes. And he pulls the wrong wall down the to, Murphy for, for, for the, <laughs> right. to pull the down wall. the bed and, and rips down like the couple mm. in the next room. <laughs> you wonder if Murphy beds even exist anymore. Mm. Some apartment somewhere. But it turns out that uh, Vilma in her, you know, like the one night with Mel actually does fall in love with him. So uh, he recovers quickly and um, 
figures he's got to get this movie made, which happens off camera, by the way. So you go right. Yeah, you from, never see you yeah. never see any of the movie whatsoever, except for the opening with Sid Caesar barking like a seal in that <laughs> MGM lion roar. And that makes me laugh every time I see it. It's so stupid. Oh, actually, that is a sound. Isn't that a sound? Like, the yeah, the little. Yeah, I thought it was more like a cat meowing. I don't know what it was. Oh, I thought it was a seal. Either mm. either or, but that is the sound now that I think about it. It is. It's funny. You get caught up in not realizing that there's no real dialogue. But, mm. Yeah. So, yeah, fast forward to the premiere of the movie and you're in the lobby and somebody ordering a, a garbage can full of popcorn, which isn't really far from reality today. No. I think that same joke is in Young Frank or in uh, Blazing Saddles as well. Or am I wrong? Maybe it was. Just I don't worst. remember. Because then there's also a Hershey bar, giant Hershey bar joke. I know we get a big gulp joke in Cannonball Run with Dom DeLuise. Um, that was a 7-Eleven tie-in. <laughs> they probably paid for that promotional. Uh, yeah, the giant Hershey bar, as you said. Yeah. Yep. And there are, there are young Frankenstein posters in the lobby. Yes, there are. Yeah. Although I didn't get like the with the people in trench coats that were buying tickets. What were they trying to uh, say there that you're lying. you're you don't get it caught dead at a Mel Brooks movie or something? Maybe. I don't know. Well, it was a sneak preview. So um, but we also so so then the film is stolen. This is the only way that um, Engulf and Devour can uh, stop this because they want to buy the studio. So yep. we steal the film. You like a Keystone Cops. Yes. Car chase ensues. And like you said, this is where the vending machine coat comes back into play where they pull in and use the uh, machine to fire. Oh, and then we get, cans. we get the, the fly in my soup choke. As yeah. Well. That's Henny Youngman. <laughs> giant. It's a giant fly that fell off. Of yep. Yeah. Again, again, you got to channel your inner nine-year-old for this. And another thing that made me chuckle is one of the, one of the cards, one of the dialogue cards was when Mel is at the end talking to Vilma. If this, <laughs> if this movie is a hit, I'll marry you. And you'll never have to take your clothes off again. <laughs> <laughs> right. My favorite was at the end is this, this was a true story. And of course, the the, the movie begins with the hello card yeah, and, and then so the, goodbye the, the goodbye card goodbye at the end. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 dated. Uh, it like has. I said, there's 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 a couple, you know, side gags and jokes that uh, could be uh, excised, but uh, it still holds up. Most of it. You know, they do some fat shaming at the expense of uh, Dom DeLuise. Like yes, because he's always, you know, snacking eating. or making them pull over yeah. to get it a pie or what have yeah. you. That would be me. But yeah, it was a hit in the summer of 1976 on a four million dollar budget. It made 36 million at the box office. And uh, according to the special features, the the documentary, the uh, audience reaction at the premiere was not unlike the audience reaction in the actual silent movie. People were adventure. uproariously laughing and gave it <laughs> and did give it a standing O at the end. Okay. Uh, I did read uh, Alan Alda was in the uh, advanced screening and he claims that uh, he laughed pretty loud. And afterwards, he was introduced to Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft. And she says, oh, that was you laughing? You see, Mel, I told you some idiot would find this funny. <laughs> <laughs> and you brought up the one the one uh, sight gag that they um, they did film it and then it didn't make the cut or it was something. That yes, they yes. The lobster scene. Yes. So so it was in the movie, but the sneak preview audiences, I guess, specifically said that that was the scene that they didn't find funny. But uh, <laughs> like. Like that's a very specific scene where people are like, "Yeah, I didn't." I didn't well, I guess probably I didn't they, appreciate that. One. They probably give them cue cards. Like, is there anything you didn't find funny? And that was overwhelmingly, for some reason, the lobster scene. So what it was is that you're in a restaurant that is completely um, the the diners are lobsters. So it's people in lobster costumes that are right. picking out people in a tank to eat, and they actually went as far as making a giant lobster claw to come down into a pool and pick out and these them. people that were in the water to, and I, I guess it was a lengthy scene and that they All just right. didn't like it. This the sneak preview audience. But I feel, I feel like I've seen that before, or maybe it was something similar was in another movie because as soon as I read that, I'm like, wow, that sounds very familiar. I mean, if it was filmed, it's out there somewhere. They showed a behind the scenes of the claw uh, going into the water. So, okay. Oh, so on yeah. The, on the Blu-ray. On the Blu-ray. Yeah. Okay. On mm. the Blu-ray. 
Uh, Mel Brooks did claim that he got all of his uh, big star cameos for under three hundred dollars a day. Ooh. That's three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. That wouldn't even buy car service now. So yeah, and just from looking at some of the the, the critics quotes, almost every single one was positive back in 1976. Yes, I think uh, Roger Ebert gave it pretty solid review. Yeah, the only curmudgeon I'm I'm seeing is Vincent Canby, New York Times. It offers a virtually uninterrupted series of smiles, but doesn't contain a single moment that ever seriously threatens to split your sides. I would argue with that. Ah, uh, my sides were not split. Yes, it was mildly <laughs> amusing. Right, not side splitting enough. <laughs> All right, sir, we'll go back. How about, how about we take out that lobster scene with that? Mm, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that might do it. That might do it. Yeah. <laughs> were they just offended that lobsters were eating people? I guess we don't care that we're, we're literally boiling these things alive. Maybe he, they were just like, oh, this is too stupid. You know, I can't take this stupidity. <laughs> I don't know. I think people <laughs> need to <a> chill. <laughs> out of all this stuff, that one seems the most innocuous. Mm. Oh, well. So I was very happy to watch this again. Yeah, so was I. So was I. It's brought back many happy childhood memories. Yes. Yeah. Like I said, it's a very, very specific time in my life. And the fact that I found that reservoir of of, uh, HBO booklets is just insane. That's just just something that you could go through just issue after issue now. And it's like, well, that's just it. I kept because I couldn't find I couldn't find it. And so because some of the movies that were on the cover, I didn't recognize. And I'm like, well, I know it came out in 76. So I had to have been at least like, again, it wouldn't have been in 78, 78. It would have already been beyond that window of when I lived in that trailer. And there it was June 1977. But you know what they would not list in those even in those issues would be the um, the little vignettes that they would show in between the movies. That's where hardware. Yep. Yeah. Hardware sure. wars. Right. Yep. I, had this, I saw that like on an early Saturday morning show before cartoons. Yep. So there yeah, was, but you're right. Those little the cartoon vignettes. Yeah. Yep. Hardware Wars. There was one other live action where it was like a reel of film that was like the blob that engulfed some guy, I remember, and ate him and then went back into the reel. You know, huh. it was all stop okay. motion. It was all stop motion, but it was live action. It wasn't animated. I remember a show called Martha's Attic. And I remember on, on HBO. Yeah, it was on HBO. And it was like it was like a Sesame Street type of uh, oh. kid show. But she used to show artwork that people would send to her. And mm-hmm. I do remember drawing something and mailing it in, but I don't it never showed no. up. Mm-hmm. At least not to my knowledge. That's always like waiting for your name on the Magic Garden. And it, that never <laughs> happened. <laughs> when I met those two ladies a couple of years ago. I said, I grew up with you guys. And she looked at me, Carol goes, and grow up, you did. And I'm <laughs> like, oh, hello. I had a, a really common name and I never heard it. Really? A, you know, mm. I'm Jim. You're never Jim. heard it. Never. Really? They actually, that's, that was part of their shtick on, in the, uh, the show is that they uh, would, they went through like people who bought tickets and, and call out their names. Mm. So. I do have a picture with them. I was very upset because when uh, they did the meet and greet afterwards, um, the original puppeteer who played Sherlock was there, but he did not come out and uh, sign autographs or take pictures. I'm like, well, uh, Sherlock's who I want to meet. <laughs> I want to meet you ladies. I want to see the chuckle patch. What do they have to? So, All right. So that, that's how many... a very specific New York. Speaking of New York stuff. It is. Pizza. Yeah, that's that York, might be uh, leave people WPIX scratching heads. Is, that might uh, leave people scratching heads. Yeah. Maybe was that was it syndicated? Maybe it was. I don't no, know. I, I think it was only on PIX. That was that's a very specific New York TV show. All right. So how many buckets out of five would we give <sighs> to Silent Movie? I, I wrote three and three quarters. I might go to four. I do enjoy it and i did i did i was very happy to watch this again uh, i'm gonna go four i'll give it three and a half okay um i still you know young frankenstein is not equaled for mel brooks movies anyway but um this is probably close second third uh yeah. it was it's up there yeah it's up there like i said the 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 time of my life and where this where this kind of stands in my brain uh, and it's it's an obscure movie, to be honest with you, because I've mentioned it many times and most people don't know what I'm talking about. Because mm. so. it's a lost movie. It really is. Like you said, it's you know not readily available 
on streaming. And um, it was only you got probably an old DVD, I imagine, an old copy of a DVD. And I can only find a, a Blu-ray in a box set of yeah. 10 other Mel Brooks movies. Mm. But at least it's there. At least That's it good. was there. At yeah. least it's there. So very cool. Silent movie. There you, you go. know, what was funny is um, as I was looking at the other discs and they were all there, which sometimes doesn't happen when Producers. you get a, like a when you, when you get a big box set like that. Like I did, I did notice missing. that the Blazing Saddles discs was not the one from the box set because they all had, you know, very identifiable artwork. Yeah. So probably they lost that at some point and they they put the DVD was it, in there Was it instead. just one movie per disc or there was... No, yeah, it was one movie per disc. Wow. So it was 10 discs. Because a lot of times they'll, they'll cram, they'll actually compress those damn things and put like two or three movies on it. Yeah, disc. nope. It was one movie wow. per disc. Wow, I'm going to have to look that up. What else was in there? Um, I think it started at Blazing Saddles, so not the producers. Oh, not the producers. Um, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Silent Movie, High Anxiety, uh, History of the World, um, Spaceballs, Robin Hood, you know, so it Men went through nice. the 80s and oh, the 90s. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Nice one. All right. So what else did we do this week? Uh, I'll let you go first. Okay, um, I have something just from last night. So after oh, all right. after getting home from uh, on the outing to the Palisades, going to see Quiet Place Day One, uh, we queued up Peacock, the streaming service, at home last night and watched Monkey Man. Oh, yes. Directed and starring and a story by Dev Patel, who oh, we all know from Slumdog Millionaire. Yeah. And okay. various other and? films, The Green Knight and what have you. Um, it's okay. It's it's pretty much John Wick. John Wick, I was gonna say it pretty much very John much Wick like a revenge. Actually, they killed, they killed his monkey. No, it's based on um what? a lore that may a or may lore, not be yeah. true. It's about the lore of the the monkey man, and so Dev Patel's character kind of clings to that. His mother is killed by a corrupt police chief. You've seen this story before, and you know, John Wick just is one of them, right. where he becomes an employee of the organization that this police chief works for to try to work his way up to get to the police chief. Oh, So, so it's John Wick who gets mystical powers, like mystical fighting powers specifically. In the beginning of the movie, he's like a bare knuckle fighter. And his character is the monkey man because he has a monkey mask. And he, but he always loses. So that's his thing is that he's the loser fighter that everybody else beats to make a name for themselves. So he later on, on purpose. He no, just, he doesn't. He's just kind of bad or he's not as so good as the it, other so fighters. If he didn't have these mystical powers bestowed upon him, he would just be a loser. Exactly. So later on, like he comes back to the, the, the bare knuckle fighting as the monkey and everybody is thinking, oh, he's just going to lose. We're all going to bet, a, bet against him. Oh, and he actually comes back and that's beats like the guy. performance enhancing drugs right there. That's not playing by the rules. At any point, does he fling poo? He does not. Yeah. Well, all right. So so he's got the mask on when he's fighting in, the, in those bare knuckle bouts. But when he actually goes in with all the John Wick gear against the guy and like kills everybody to get to no the mask. police chief he doesn't have the mask on i would have liked to have seen him keep the mask sure on. Yeah, yeah i thought that was the whole selling point it's yeah like he was like this this mad monkey on the and they never they never once play the rolling Stones song monkey man monkey man. which i was waiting for but doesn't happen just <laughs> they a bunch really of could. they couldn't like, get the rights it's like loud rap music that they play throughout most of it now brass monkey by the uh bc boys no wow no. Some miss opportunity. But it was it was it was okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, it's if you want like a John Wick fix, then just go watch that. But um it was okay. Actually, actually just go and watch John Wick. Yeah, exactly. Not not the monkey man. Mm -hmm. But it's on the uh paid version of Peacock. It is correct. Okay. It is. So I they know is there is there still a free version of Peacock? There is, but um, is there? mine they call it the premium. So okay, that means that the Three or four commercials play before the movie starts. Oh, and then, not in the middle. And then it runs uninterrupted. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, I found myself a new show. I heard another podcast talk about it, and uh, I'd come across it, and I was just like, it didn't really catch me in what I was reading. But it, So it's on Amazon Prime. 
Uh, it is called Outer Range with Josh Brolin. And on the outside, it just plays like a Yellowstone ripoff. It's this Montana family, you know, and there's these these battles with other farm families over lands. Uh, and there's a backstory of a daughter-in-law who's been missing for a couple months. They have two two grown sons and the granddaughter lives with them. Uh, and Josh Brolin plays it very gruff. He's just this grumpy man. Um until it's revealed that there is a vortex slash time portal in one mm-hmm. of his fields. Okay. Um, so I'm about five episodes in. There is some weird, uh, there's like this hippie girl that's living on their property. Uh, there's a story of the two sons getting into it with the rival family. And I'm not going to ruin it for you, but um it this all happens in the first episode they accidentally kill him and so dad decides that he's going to take care of it by throwing the body in this hole okay and then uh crazy stuff happens Mm. so it's there's a lot going on here and at the same time nothing's going on because it is very much a a like i said a yellowstone type of drama where there's fighting over land and the sheriff is trying to piece together what's going on um and I don't know who her, the, the actress's name, but she's uh, Native American uh, and she's trying to become sheriff. Uh, so but it's enough to keep me going because there's there's that weird X factor kind of thing in the backgrounds. Um, OK, so it's outer outer range. On prime, uh, it looks like there is a season two coming or it may have already dropped. But like I said, I'm, I'm five episodes in and I'll probably watch a couple more today. So I'm intrigued. Okay. I'll stick with it. I'll stick right. with it and, and see what's going on. And and he's like I said, he's such a curmudgeon. He's just a, like the half of his his dialogue is just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got like this fantastic goatee that just juts out of his face. Like there's a lot of times because of his cowboy hat, he's completely shrouded in shadow, except for his his mm. uh, mustache and beard. He's 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 that way in a lot of his roles right yeah. very gruff and so you, you yeah. kind of expect him to be that way in reality like i said episodes come in and you start getting a little bit more backstory um you know and the granddaughter's in there and she just wants to hang out with grandma and grandpa and there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on so it's intriguing so nobody wears a monkey mask mm. not yet yeah oh and there's and there's this mystical buffalo with two arrows sticking out of it that just kind of randomly shows up every now and again what what he symbolizes or or what he's uh what he's doing there i have no idea so very cool all right all right so, so what are we doing what are, what are we doing well so we're going back to the 80s right kind of we are we are kind of uh it's not a movie made in the 80s but it takes place in the 80s 1985 to be exact and we did see a trailer for this at the beginning of a quiet place day one. At least I did. I actually saw the trailer for this back uh, when we saw the fall guy and I haven't seen it since. Yeah, I've seen I've seen it a few times now, um, but I need to do it. So we're talking about Maxine, Maxine yes, with three are. X's. Yeah. So um, you have your work cut out for you. I do. And I'm halfway there because uh, you and uh, Christina who is no longer on the show, covered those first two movies. This is the third in a trilogy. Ty West is the director. Ty West is the director. And the two other movies are X and Pearl. Yes. And I do remember listening to that episode and uh, said, nope, not for me. And yet here I am. You're making me watch this crap. (laughs) Um, I did watch X last night. So I got that taste in my mouth mm-hmm. and we'll see we'll see pearl that i was actually able to rent from the library pearl i'm gonna have to buy on demand i'm oh, gonna have to okay. pay for that nobody has that available so okay. but i will i will be caught up when we uh when we cover maxine mm. so i'm looking now and we're kind of undecided so far on what we're going to pair with maxine uh, um we're 
getting very heavy, you know, X vibes from this title, Maxine having three X's. So we always love a good kaiju. There is one called the X from Outer Space, um, which is one of my childhood favorites. I do see that it is on Max. So do you want to do a kaiju movie? I Do you really have to ask me that? <laughs> I thought maybe we just do Debbie Does Dallas. <laughs> so, since we're basically going into uh, porn. Because you could do like Avenging Angel and some of those other VHS goodies that uh, we used to watch. Yes, we but, could. Uh, I will. I will always go kaiju. All right, over porn, because that's the kind of nerd I am. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'd rather watch. I'd rather watch a monster. Than... Right. So this was a WPIX or maybe WNEW staple. So I'll be interested to see if this sparks any memories from you. Uh, the okay. X from outer space. Now, is this referred? Is this called anything else besides X from outer space? Like sometimes no. those movies have numerous nomenclatures no well the actual japanese title is yes. cosmic giant monster gilala so <laughs> well, i like that better <laughs> but there's no x in it there's no x in it but no. i believe according to what i'm seeing it is on max as okay. the x from outer space okay but yeah one of my favorite uh, kaiju names for a monster of all time gilala <laughs> gilala like gilala monster gilala is the monster Kilala. Kilala. All right. Very cool. So, yes, I will do my homework. I will be caught up with the Maxine universe or whatever you want to refer to it as. Okay. And now she is the she is the main character that survives at the end of this movie X that I just watched. Yes, yeah, she is. OK, so you see her driving off into her future, which uh, is this Dude, movie. Can Maxine. I just tell you, th this is what I want, meant to say before that movie, this X movie gave me such tourist trap vibes. Uh, yeah. Right. Like yeah. I was like, all right, this is pretty much just an update. Well, with a lot more sex in it, but. Yeah. And you just substitute the uh, mannequins with old people. And <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was going to be, well, we'll get into it. You know what? That's, that's cut it here. Um, I will play catch up. I'll watch Pearl and then we'll watch. Yeah. Uh, you thought scene. that there was a lot because to unload with the quiet I, place. There's even yeah, more to unload I think, with these. I think we have to uh, just kind of parse this out. So we'll see. Yeah. All right. So Maxine in X from Outer Space. Yeah. Uh, a little counter program. I'll have to cleanse my palate from this all this mm -hmm. porn crap. Yep. And hopefully the graphic really features the letter X that you may. <laughs> oh, 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 now I'm being challenged to put an X. Yep. X marks the spot. Uh, yes. Okay. There you go. That's my headline. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much as always for listening. Yes, thank you. That was that was actually a lot of fun. It was. Um, go check out. It sounds like people are watching A Quiet Place Day One. Hey, hey, uh, they, if it's getting you into the theaters, that's great. Yeah, just, just be quiet. Turn and turn just your brain off. Please stop. Turn off your phone and just watch the damn movie. You mm -hmm. can't. You do need to talk. That's when the aliens come and get you. Mm -hmm. Shut up. Did Lapita actually come on as she did in my theater and say? Yes. Yeah. Sit yeah. back, be quiet. Yeah, yeah. Didn't, yeah. didn't matter to those two ladies behind me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stay home. It's great to catch up. <sighs> yeah, exactly. Let's go to the movies where we can talk for two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Go to a pizzeria and get some New York style pizza. I heard Patsy's is actually pretty good. Uh, so did I. Let's go. Yeah. All right, man. Always a pleasure. Always. Take care, and uh, we'll talk next time. Bye. Bye. If you like what you just heard, be sure to follow TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Kind on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Spotify, or whatever you listen to your podcasts on. Also, be sure to email us at TMIPodcast2018 at gmail.com. You can also follow us on all of our socials. Uh, we're on Instagram, X, Facebook, Threads. Just go to TMIConfessionalsPodcast.com. All of our links are there. And leave us a five-star review. See you at the concession stand. So as Subway tickets go up in price, so do pizza slices. This is actually referred to as the pizza principle. So it used to be a didn't, little... Uh, listen, didn't, I, didn't Jenna Jackson have that as a song on one of the, her uh, The pizza principle. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's uh, Miss Jackson if you're hungry. <laughs>